welcome back everybody. Oh my God, I am just so pumped to have a very, very special guest with us today. Um, his name is Daniel Vitalis and he's a writer, podcaster, public speaker and lifestyle pioneer in the sphere of human health, personal development and strategic living. Encouraging us to rewild ourselves, he teaches that invincible health is produced by a life aligned with our biological design. So welcome, Daniel. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Well, it's really glad to be here. Now, today we are going to dive into the return of the wild woman and why that's so important and what that actually means. But before we get started, for those of my beautiful tribe who have no idea what rewilding even means, um, can you please give us a little bit of an insight into what that actually means and looks like? Yeah, I'll give you an insight into what it looks like and means for me because the word is definitely caught on in a lot of different spheres and it's being used in a lot of different ways. But my primary interest and the question I've been asking myself for a couple of decades now is, what are human beings like without the influence of civilization? In other words, what kind of animal are we? How do we behave? How do we live? How do we interact with each other? What do we eat? How do we go to the bathroom? How do we make love? Like, what is our, what's natural to us? Because we spend all this energy questing in all these different areas and trying to make up new stuff. And it always seemed to me, whatever was most natural for us would probably be what is most healthy for us. Because as a species with three and a half million years of evolution behind us, we are certainly adapted to whatever we were doing in nature. Well, I pursued that question a long time and eventually really came to understand that 10,000 years ago, which in three and a half million years of hominid evolution is just this tiny little sliver of our history, just recently we made a tremendous life change away from living in wild nature toward farm living, agricultural living, and therefore domestication. We domesticated a lot of plants, we domesticated a lot of animals, and in the process we domesticated ourselves. And there's been a lot of great benefits that have come with that, but there's also been a lot of, maybe not a story not fully told about all of the suffering that's created for us that could look like the suppression of our wild behaviors. It could be the alterations in our diet, our landscape, our homes, our health. It could be all of the degenerative diseases that have emerged and all the kind of neuroses that comes when you fight your own nature. So when I say rewild yourself, I mean get in contact with the part of yourself that's wild and authentic and let that thing express again because our culture creates taboos against all our wild behaviors and tries to subjugate them. So I think my job is to be an advocate for personal freedom, but I don't mean that in the way maybe nation states talk about freedom because they don't ever really need freedom. They mean free range. They mean freedom like we would say a free range chicken has freedom. And I mean, no, freedom like the wild animal that the chicken comes from living in the jungle, jungle fowl, that's the wild animal, or the wolf to the dog. The dog is a wolf, but the dog is the domesticated version, and the wolf is a wild animal. Well, there's a wild homo sapien, and that's the hunter-gatherer, and we can look to them to see how they live and get input on how we can live and how we can be happier, healthier, more fit, more robust, and less neurotic as we kind of live in this modern world. Mm, sounds good. Sign me up. <laughs> You're signed up. So can you give a little bit of a background of your health journey and how you got to where you are right now? I know it's, you know, how long have we got, but, you know, a little bit of a nutshell version for yeah. those people who have never um, been introduced to you and your amazing work. Well, I really come at this from, you know, a really different angle than I think a lot of people do because I grew up quite poor and definitely like a street kid with a, a really unhealthy home. And there was a lot of sadness there and a lot of pain, but there was this little thing happening on the side that was a, a blessing in disguise. And that was that I didn't go through schooling the way most people do. Um, I had a really alternative journey through that. I didn't interact with extended family the way most people grow up doing. In fact, I really only interacted with my mom and my mom had a lot of mental health issues. And so it was a really isolated upbringing. Now, sounds kind of sad, but it means that I didn't get as much of an imprint. I was almost divergent. I didn't really have to accept all the same mental programming, physical programming that a lot of people around me did. And I learned to raise myself and I taught myself and I educated myself. And by the time I reached adulthood, it became really obvious to me I had a really alternative way of looking at the world. Um, that has 
fed in and led to because I followed my own path. And that led to me honestly really wanting to just know how to stay alive and how to take care of myself. I, start, I, you know, I would ask questions when I was a kid, like, well, what's the best way to do this? What's the best way to do this? No one seemed to have any answers. So I kept questing after them and questing after them. Eventually, I figured out that if I was doing something unnatural, I was fighting something that can't be, you know, you're fighting a force that can't be won. And I started to really align myself with nature. And over time, a lot of answers came that I started to see other people needed, wanted, were questing after. But they kept going to their zookeepers asking for input rather than going to nature herself. And so my journey has been a really alternative one and one that I'm really grateful for today. And it was difficult on the way up for about just almost 10 years now, I've been on the public speaking circuit, sharing and getting to speak on stage, getting to speak to large groups. Now, when I was younger, I worked a lot with kids. Um, in my 20s, especially, I worked with children with special needs, and I learned how to communicate with children. And what I've come to understand, especially as an adult learner, as well as a lifelong adult learner, you know, a lot of the things that I learned through this life, I learned, if I wanted to learn the simple way possible. And I think a lot of adults are like that, but we we uh, we and almost heap pomp and circumstance onto information so make it appear more sophisticated. But most of us learn best with the idiot's guide. Most of us learn best with the kids' book style education. And so I've learned to communicate with adults the way I communicated with special needs kids, simply from the heart with authenticity. And that's a really easy way for most of us to receive things. And I've also come to understand that if something is complicated and hard to understand, it's usually because the person communicating doesn't really understand it. And when we have a really complex worldview we're supposed to accept about where we come from and how we should live, it's really complicated. It's probably not true because anything living in nature just simply knows how to live. Squirrels don't go to squirrel camp. Lions don't go to lion education school. They don't have to. They simply act from their their instinctual behavior and by observing the other ones around them. We have to get all this education, not because we need to learn how to live, because we're being trained how um, we're being trained to not pay attention to how our instincts inform us on how to live. And so I got to bypass a lot of that. I was really lucky. And uh, here I am today getting to share my heart's message with the world. And um, my experience is as long as I stay really authentic and I stay in the heart and I align myself with nature, the message comes across really easily and very clearly. And it's really accepted by just about everybody I get to come across. And it's been a, the biggest blessing of my life, of course. Yeah. Well, thank you for the work you do. I love <laughs> it. My husband loves it. And, you know, my tribe are going to love it too. So how would you suggest people get back in touch with that intuition, that innate knowingness that we all have that you, you know, you said that we've kind of disconnected from a little bit, you know, what are some ways that we can get back in touch with that? Well, I think mean, the first and most obvious thing is that we spend time outside. The word domestication means of the house. We have become of the house. In other words, our habitat is no longer nature itself, but is a kind of virtual reality we've made for ourselves, like a little bubble that we've created called the house. And we seal that off. I mean, literally seal it off from the elements, right? We seal it off with heat. For heat, we seal it off for air conditioning, we bring in artificial water, we bring in artificial food, we bring in artificial materials, and we fill that up with sort of virtual artifacts. The word artifact and the word artificial come from the same place, right? Art, an artifact, something artificial, is something that bears the mark of human will. We surround ourselves with artificial things uh, as opposed to natural things. Um, and create kind of a human world that is not part of nature. And in that world, we're getting sicker and sicker. And I think we're getting stupider and stupider. And I think a lot of people can see that, mm -hmm. that cutting ourselves off from the incredibly, the incredibly sophisticated network of living organisms around the world isolates us and we start to um, degenerate. So one of the most important things we can do is get outside again. Another thing I would offer is that we can start to look at ways that we repress our animal. You know, when I say our animal, I mean our bodies. It's like our animal. You can think of it like you have an ape that you need to take care of. Imagine if you were sort of given a chimpanzee and your job was to take care of that chimpanzee. Well, that has actually happened to you. You've been given a homo sapien. It's very closely related to the chimpanzee. It's your job to take care of it. And if we uh, constantly poison it, if we constantly strap uh, shoes onto it and tight belts, if we wrap ties around its neck, right, if we've caused it to be restricted all the time, 
Can we make it sit in chairs all day long under fluorescent lights? If we force it to do menially boring tasks that it doesn't want to do all the time, it gets lazy, it gets sick, it gets bored, it gets depressed. So we've got to free that animal a little bit. And I think also when we start to look around at all the ways that we've accepted shame for that animal, the way that animal naturally smells, the sex that animal wants to have, the foods that animal wants to have, little things like maybe being afraid to eat with our hands or being afraid to take our shoes off or being able to speak freely as we want to or being able to have a little bit of stubble on our faces. It's like all the ways that we try to hide that we're an animal chip away at us mm. and add shame and add discomfort. So I think we just start to layer by layer free ourselves. One of the places in my experience, and I come from the nutrition world, is you know, I think food is one of the best doorways into connecting with our inner animal. Uh, learning how to feed our animal properly, you know, because we grew up on what I think is the equivalent of a factory farm diet. You know, if you think about a farm where the way they raise animals, the goal is not to keep those animals alive forever and be healthy as they can be. The goal is to get them to peak productivity and you'll feed them anything you need to do to fatten them up to the place they need to be or to get them to lay eggs or in our case to get us to pay taxes. And so we've been on an industrial feeding program, and a lot of us find when we start to eat natural foods again, whole foods, organic foods, juices, naturally raised animals, when we start to get on that path, the domestication starts to, it's like it puts a little hole in the water balloon, and stuff starts leaking out that isn't part of us. Slowly, slowly, we detox out that civilized repressed domesticated part of ourselves. So for me, that's always been my favorite doorway to lead people back to their animal. Mm. And you have a couple of elements that you talk about that make up your holistic beliefs. Can you uh, tell us about those different elements? Is there six, is it? Sure. Well, here's how I look at I look at life. I look at life as being this sort of, and the same way our ancestors did around the world. You know, human beings as an ape really spread around the world. We're profound in that way. We lived everywhere and we share this kind of common view of nature. And that's that it's made up of four elements. So earth, water, air, fire. Now we've all heard that and we all understand it, I think, metaphorically. But if you look at the actual planet, you'll see it's actually really made of that. So so the earth part or what scientists call solids would be like sort of the earth itself. And then floating on top of the earth is another layer uh, of water, right? It's literally the oceans, the sea. So we call the solid part the geosphere, the solids, earth. But then there's this layer around it, the hydrosphere, water, the element of water. Floating on top of there is literally another sphere called the atmosphere. That's the layer of gases or air. And then outside of that is all that sunlight energy, which is plasma, or the heliosphere of the sun. And it's literally fire. So we live in a world made of earth, water, air, and fire. And we actually need to eat and eat those things every day. So we have to eat solid food or earth. We have to drink liquid water. We have to breathe air. And we need sunlight. And if we're missing any of those four elements our bodies will break down. And so I think classically nutrition has been understood as just food and we've really been kind of missing this bigger piece. Now we understand that if we set up an aquarium, we know that the fish are going to need food, they're going to need water, they're going to need the air bubbler, and they're going to need that lamp on top to be like the sun. And we know that you need those four elements to raise a fish tank. And I think if we realize that we're like a fish tank, and we're a lot of little organisms, including our own cells. We're lots and lots of fungi and bacteria and viruses all living in a symbiosis, a kind of sea, a kind of aquarium inside a skin. We start to take care of ourselves the way we might an aquarium. Instead of just thinking about food, we start thinking about food and water and air and sunlight. Those things will really take us a lot further than just the simple nutrition program. And, and I'd add a few things to that. I'd say that we need to really think about the balance of being awake and moving and being at rest or sleeping and making sure that we have the right balance of those two things all day as well because obviously when we put an animal in a stall and that could be a human being in a cubicle, right? It's like the horse in the stall. What's beautiful about the horse, the way it can run. What's beautiful about humans, the way they walk, the way they climb, the way they jump, the way they flip and roll and have fun. That's not happening in most of our lives. And so we need to spend our days moving and we need to spend our nights really sleeping really sleeping. And so we've fallen out, of course, of our circadian rhythm with nature, right? Our relationship to the sun and the moon and the cycles of those things. And we're living in that artificial world I talked about before. I call it artifact land. And the light's all wrong in artifact land. We don't get the right sleep, right? So I think we're just starting to reestablish 
the relationship with those things again, uh, we are capable of much more. And we don't need to put all our energy into chasing dogmatic paths or getting new products. I mean, that's not the answer. Those things are, can be augmentation for us. But the relationship that's missing is not a relationship to products or supplements or foods. or what. It's a relationship to nature itself. And when we get aligned with that, all these things I've been talking about, they start to fall into place real simply, real simply. Absolutely. And now where you live, you're very much in nature. Uh, was this a conscious choice to kind of, I don't know if you lived in a city beforehand, but was it a conscious choice for you to go and just be immersed in nature more? Yeah. And, and I... I, I don't want to sound like a Luddite. Like I don't, I'm not somebody who expects that everyone can or will do that. But I do live in nature. So I live in Maine, the most forested state in the United States. It's a state that actually a lot of people, it's funny because a lot of people don't know where it is who live in the United States. You know, like Maine, where's that one again? Um, Maine is a beautiful forested area. So I get immersion in nature. But that said, I do live in the modern world too. And I live in the virtual world. So I'm always sharing with my students, listen, we need to be supremely adaptable apes. We need to adapt to three environments. We need to adapt to the natural world. Now, most people are not adapted to the natural world, even people who live rurally. Right? So people might live outside of the city in nature, but that doesn't mean they actually know how to live outside their homes. Mm. So there's a difference between living out in the wilderness and actually being out in the wilderness, right? Those are two different things. So, so I talk about becoming adapted to that, learning how to spend time in nature effectively. But we also need to be adapted to urban environments because, let's face it, we're in them all the time. More and more of the world's becoming that. So I don't want to sound like somebody who just thinks, I've got to hide out in the country, right? That's not realistic. And I enjoy going where people are. So when I do that, I need to learn how to take these behaviors that I've been talking about and adapt them to the urban environment. And then, of course, more and more, uh, as we are right now, we spend time in the virtual world. And as you know, anybody who hasn't figured out how to live in the virtual world effectively is going to have a challenging time in the coming years because more and more, you know, more and more our money is made there, our relationships are made there, our connections are maintained there, our communications happen there. So I think the modern human needs to be adapted to all of those. Most people are least adapted to nature, and that's the one where most people could use the most work, and, I, and that's the most healing. Mm. That's where the healing is at, right? The healing isn't going to come in the city, and the healing isn't going to come in the virtual world. The healing comes with that connection to nature. Um, so yes, I consciously live rurally, but I also love to try out and see the world and see and meet new people, um, but I love to come back to nature and recharge myself because the urban environment really takes a lot out of people. And some people are so habituated to it, they don't realize they're running on empty tanks all the time, you know? Absolutely. Do you feel a difference? I mean, in your body, when you're in the city, <laughs> yeah. you feel it? Yeah, yeah, I presume so. So what are some of the things that you do to bring bring that, uh, that you know, what you have in Maine into when you go to the city? What are some of the tangible things that you you do? Well, I really think about foraging the environment that I'm in. Yeah. So as a game almost, wherever I'm in, whenever, whenever I'm in a new environment, I like to imagine I'm a hunter-gatherer in that environment looking for foods that are actually sustenance for me. You know, that can happen in an airport. That can happen in a major urban center. That can be a small town I'm driving through, but eventually we got to resource ourselves, right? And one thing I've noticed, and you know, I come out of a very extreme nutrition background where people literally bring everything with them all the time and run the risk of becoming such prima donnas that they're actually no longer adapted anymore, right? So they start acting like they're astronauts, right? Like astronauts have to bring everything with them. So I, I try to get away from that a little bit and have a little leeway to forage the best thing in my environment. Now, if I'm in the city, that means I can go to a really good health food store or a good farm to table restaurant. And I can find really good food there. But what about when I'm in the airport? Mm. It's challenging, but it's getting better. And you can find that little bit of organic this or something organic over here. And, and so I love kind of foraging through my environment. I'm always looking for the clean air. 
and always thinking about how I can improve the air where I am. So that's another piece. You know, we were talking before about the atmosphere and how we need the four elements. Um, I'm very conscientious about mold and mildew in environments. So when I'm traveling, it's like, is this an environment that will make me sick or is this a healthy one? Because you might get one hotel room that is absolutely toxic air and you can tell and you might get another one with a window that opens and it's less moldy. Or there might be a, you know, you might stay here and there's plants and over here there's not. Or you remember back when hotel rooms had windows that wouldn't open. You know, that's changed a little bit, but, but I'm always making sure to request one where I can get fresh air. And so I'm always thinking about the air quality. I'm thinking about sunlight, making sure that I'm not getting um, kept away from sunlight too much, making sure that I get exposure and access when I'm on the go, when I'm traveling, when I'm in the city. Because cities are like virtual canyons. And they shade out the sunlight, right? So we got to find that. Um, we got to look for that. And we also have to be really conscientious about artificial light in the city and how it's impacting us, particularly from computers and television sets, which signal to our body that it's noontime because they put out a really bright blue light and they trick our circadian rhythm. And we don't produce melatonin. Our sleep cycle's off. We're not able to purge cancer cells out of our bodies effectively. So I'm always thinking about how to take the environment I'm in and make its light cycle resemble nature a little bit more, if that makes sense. So kind of always playing with these elements and really working on my element, elementary mastery. Also looking for places where I can move effectively, places where I can get my shoes off. Another thing I'm always doing is looking for cold water that I can get into. I love to uh, illegally skinny dip whenever possible. Or legally, I'll do legally or illegally. Uh, but looking for bodies of water I can immer immerse myself in. I'm sure you're familiar with my website, findaspring.com, which is a database of cold water springs. So again, when I'm traveling, looking for spring water that comes out of the ground that I can drink. I'm kind of a lifestyle, but more than that, like a quest or a, like a hero's quest, like a game. Like what people are doing on video games, but real life. Like finding a quest and going out and looking for those, looking for all the juiciest parts of nature and bringing them, in, bringing them in. And of course, one of the best things when you're traveling is asking people, hey, where's the great nature spots around here? And getting taken out to the cliffs or the waterfalls or the ocean or the, the spring or whatever, really the hot spring, whatever the really cool places are and making sure that I'm getting out to those. And then when I'm in the city, you know, also not letting it, not letting myself get uh, feel shame or guilt about being there. Not let not the the most toxic thing is walking around being like it's so toxic here. Oh my god, I can't. Oh, this is really affecting me. Like letting it really beat you down. So just going in there and really shining your energy, um, I think is really crucial. So it's about finding those balances, but also going through the artificial environment looking for the best stuff that's there for you, and it's there. Absolutely. It's there. Yeah. That's really powerful what you said because we spend a lot of our time in the city but we also have a place in the hinterlands which is just like my heaven. It's it's amazing. Um, but that's an hour flight for us to go to and so we don't get to go there as much as we would love to but I'm, I sometimes have that little bit of guilt being here. You know, this isn't right. This is so toxic. And that is more toxic than actually being here. So you've really inspired me to just embrace being when I'm in the city and just not letting that affect me. And then when I'm, you know, in the hinterlands, it's about embracing and soaking up as much nature as I possibly can. And I want, can I add to that that there's there, it can sound a little um, – a little fairy tale the way we describe it sometimes, but more and more the science is emerging. And when you're out in nature, when you get to be at that heavenly retreat of yours, you're you're not just soaking up nature, but you're soaking up electrons. Mm. So more and more this is getting this is coming clear that the when food is fresh, when we say fresh food, we're talking about that food's still electron rich. I mean, think about the difference if we took a piece of ginger and we took some powdered ginger. Right? Both are good foods, but the powdered ginger, if we smelled it, it would smell like ginger. It would have a strong smell, but that would be it. If we broke open a piece of fresh ginger, there's like a, there's something there that infuses you. There's something more than just the smell. There's all this water and electron energy, and that those electrons are what we're after. We need fresh food for that reason. When we drink water out of the spring versus water out of a bottle, and both will put water into your body. Water out of the bottles, kind of flat. Mm. We'd almost say it's dry if it wasn't water, right? It's just 
not that hydrating. When we drink water from the earth out of a spring moving water, it's electron rich and there's a refreshingness that comes from that. We call that fresh water. When we're indoors all day, we're breathing the air inside, it's lost its electron energy. No ions are left and it starts to make us tired. And then if we push open the door and that first fresh air that comes in, it hits us like that ginger does, right? Just electrons are there and then the whole system all of that electric electric energy that electric system is fueled by the power like the like your phone is powered by plugging it into the to the electric socket on the wall we're fueled by plugging in to the light of the sun on our skin and through our eyes and when we get out in that it starts to power our whole system so it's not just, oh, it's pretty in nature, oh, the colors are nice, right? But it's like we are literally trying to suck in as much electron energy and charge the batteries up, so to speak, because it's like with, with your phone. You plug your phone in, you get it up to 100%, but the more you use it, the faster that battery goes down. The more we're out in the city, the quicker our battery's going down, the more we're engaging out there, the more we're draining that. So we got to get out there and recharge the batteries, and that's what nature's doing for us. Absolutely. And why is this so important for um, the women? You know, why is it so important that we, you know, return to our wildness and, and come back to that space? Well, all of humanity has been domesticated. Outside of the few, there's about 100 uncontacted tribes still in the world today. Now, that to me just always, every time I say that, it just shocks me that there are still hunter-gatherers in the world today, but there are small pockets of them, and they won't probably live that way for much longer. Um, what we know about them, though, and what we know about cultures from the past who've now disappeared, is that in hunter-gatherer societies, these are pre-agricultural people. So this, these are people who never got on the bandwagon that started six to 10,000 years ago of farming, but still live like animals in nature, essentially human animals in nature. We know that they're egalitarian. And that is not true of any farming civilization that's ever developed since the first wheat went in the ground, probably about ten to 14,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. Since then, all civilizations, civilizations are city builders and city builders are fueled by farming. All of them have been patriarchal. And women have been subjugated in those um, civilizations. Now, that's not true of hunter-gatherers around the world. Now, most people don't realize that. They assume that hunter-gatherers must be patriarchal, that the women must have been controlled. And a lot of people think, oh, this has gone on for so, so long. Well, the reality is women were, were equal to men and equal opposite to men. And this is one of the things I want to draw that distinction from what we're seeing today. Today, we're seeing this idea of equality that means homogeny between men and women, which I think is fairly distasteful. I don't really love that idea of women becoming masculine, men becoming feminine, and everybody neutralizing across the board. I think that that's appropriate for some small percentage of the population who, who that's real for them. But most of us f feel the new kind of equality isn't really uh, lighting us up, right? Really not lighting us up. In the past, men and women were equal opposite. So their roles were different, but both were considered sovereign. None ruled over the other. Now... Some interesting things happen in this idea of domestication because you remember before I said domestication means of the house. Well, when this started, a new model for human beings to live emerged, and it's called husbandry. And husbandry is a really fascinating thing. The word husband has four definitions. And the one most of us think of when we hear husband, of course, is the relationship of a, a man to his wife. But it has three other meanings as well. One is to manage, raise, and harvest domesticated plants. One is to raise, manage, and harvest domesticated animals. So a, like a, a wheat husbandman, right? Wheat husbandry or, or plant husbandry is to raise plants. Animal husbandry is to raise animals. Husband To husband one's resources is the third meaning. That is uh, the, truly is the, the meaning, the definition is the management of a household. So if you think about a house, the cultivation of the house, to manage that is to be a husband. So a husband is four things. It's a person who controls the lives and genetics of plants, animals, the house, and women. In other words, when a woman gets a husband, she really gets a farmer. Mm. She really chooses a farmer. So 
is built into our culture. Now, obviously, most modern women, that's not what they're thinking when they get married, but I want to examine the roots of it a little bit because it shines light on how we've been living for the last six to 10,000 years. So the word with is the old English word for woman, and it survives today as the word wife. Now, the word were used to mean man in Old English, and that's where we get words like werewolf. Werewolf is man-wolf. Now, notice that the vows are very interesting. The man is asked, do you take this woman to be your wife? Which means, do you take this woman to be your with? Which means, do you take this woman to be your woman? But she's asked, do you take this man to be your husband? Which means, do you take this man to be your farmer? In other words, that vow is a submission to male dominance or male patriarchy. Then her name is switched to his name. Her line is then erased, and she falls under the patriarchal lineage, which fall, goes all the way up a sort of pyramid scheme type, Ponzi scheme type uh, thing to the top where the king rules, of course. And I was amused, you know, we hear sitting's the new smoking, right? We know our chairs aren't good for us. The highest office that can be held in a civilization is a chair. It's a throne, right? It's literally, that's as far as you can go. The very top of it, you get a chair, you get to be a chairman. So interesting that women then fall underneath that. Now that didn't used to exist. This wasn't this way before. We see this story told in the Christian Bible where it describes there's a sort of sin moment and Adam and Eve are punished and Adam's told he now has to be a farmer and grow wheat and eat bread. And Eve is told she now has to live under her husband. In other words, prior she didn't live under her husband. It was a punishment. So that's how that was sold to people. Well, where we're living today is that women have been under this system for a really long time. And if men have been in control of plants, of animals, of the household, and of women, and it's built into our language, no amount of protesting, no amount of you know, marching, and no amount of you know, egalitarian campaigns can work till we address this at its root. And we need to address it in the language. And this idea of he's my husband needs to shift. Maybe he's my man, but he's my husband literally means he's my farmer. So I just want to point one last thing out on this. There's a fantastic study that's been going on for over 50 years in Russia. They wanted to understand domestication a little bit more. So they took silver foxes, a wild animal, silver foxes, to see if they could domesticate them. And what they did was they would, they would find the silver foxes that were most... Uh, most amicable with people that like to interact with people and they would put them over here and they would take the ones that were most aggressive to people and they'd put them over here mm -hmm. and they would only breed together the aggressive ones and they would only breed together the the docile ones after 50 years they've raised two completely different populations of silver foxes mm -hmm. one that are like the sweetest little puppies and they're even selling them for pets and another kennel that are so aggressive you can't even really go near them I would say that we've done something really similar with women for 6,000 years now, that any woman who has stood up to the patriarchy has traditionally been stoned to death, uh, burned alive, drowned. Uh, there's been periodic purgings of strong women. So we have things like witch trials, which come around periodically, where women are literally killed out, taken out of the gene pool. So sort of what's happening is we've been creating that docile population of women for and we've been killing off all the aggressive ones. So the ones who don't accept the patriarchy have been taken out of the gene pool. That, that leaves us with a population of women who we can't effectively say we know what their wild expression is because they've been bred into docility. So at this point where we're at is women are just starting to kind of find themselves again. It's been like 10,000 years of this. And men are just kind of, men are a little panicked right now trying to figure out how to relate to women because they've had this sort of uh, privilege of control. Now, it's not really a privilege. It kind of sucks to have to be in control of everything. Like having to be in control of all the animals, plants, the house, and the women. It's a lot of work. I would not want to have to be a husband. But uh, we're all having to figure, we're having to meet each other again. I think for the first time in, in a long time, we're having to meet women all over again. And we're going to have to accept that they're not who they've been pretending to be because they were only pretending to be that way to stay alive. Wow. Holy moly, mind-blowing. I've got... 
full on goosebumps. Um, so <laughs> amazing because I see a lot of women, you know, they come to me and they come to my events and they are so masculine and they are trying to wear every different hat. Um, and they're striving to be the, you know, the career woman and run the house and, you know, wear all of these different hats. But, um, I fully believe that it's it's about stepping back into our feminine power and really embracing that. And then a lot of people say to me, oh, but then I won't be motivated and I won't get anything done and, you know, I, I will lose my drive or I won't want to do my, you know, the work that I do. Um, what would you say to that? Wow, you know, there's different types of strength. I mean, there is the oak tree is strong. It stands up and dominates the wind. It, it stays standing by dominating the wind, but the pine tree is strong by receiving the wind, right? So it bends and it accepts the wind, and it's just as strong. In fact, it might be stronger. I think the oak tree, which is rigid and hard in the wind, is much more likely to be broken by it versus the, the adaptability and the bendiness and the receptiveness of the pine. So... Unfortunately, the, what our culture's done, here's what our culture's done. I'll speak for the United States at least because I live here. Um, men have been progressively over the last 20 years really shamed for expressions of masculinity. So men have chosen to start to feminize themselves. And then women have thought, well, if I'm going to step up, I'm going to have to be, I'm going to have to fight my way into this male world. So they're taking on all this masculinity. The problem is it's not authentic for either. It's a turnoff for both sides. I'll tell you, um, for me, nothing turns me off more than a woman who tries to compete with me in a masculine way. It's like, well, we're going to make great friends, but that's, we're not going to ever be lovers. We're not ever going to be able to exchange and, and cultivate energy together because I'm like that. I'm, I'm masculine, so I need receptivity. Um, I was just in Los Angeles uh, all last weekend, and the men there are just complaining you know, about how hard it is to find feminine women there because so many women are there like going to make it happen. And I understand that, but I think that they're trying to take on the oak tree paradigm, which they're not built for. What we need to see more of is the true strength of receptivity, the true strength of women. Now, for that to happen... We need to bring back some of the wild woman archetype. Mm. And I think where that starts is really embracing what is feminine. And maybe at the, at the simplest level, it's like embracing a woman's moon cycle, right? Women embracing that part of themselves, their fertility, um, women spending more time together. I love this kind of red tent movement idea or women gathering together for moon lodges. I think women need to take back the power of birth. This idea of men birthing the children is so illogical, silly, stupid, and ridiculous. Aren't any, you know, OBGYNs who might hear that? It's like, this is a woman's, this is for women. This is not something men are supposed to do. It's not something men should do. We don't need to be handling that for you or telling you how it should be or making you lie on your back and push a baby up backwards through gravity. I mean, it's just completely insane. Women have always done this and need to be doing it. Traditional men and women are separate for much of the day. So traditionally, men are hunting, women are gathering, and women are doing process work, like creating cordage, weaving baskets. Women in nature have babies all the time. I mean, constantly have babies. So they're constantly holding babies, and babies are strapped to them. So if you picture what we come from for three and a half million years, we come from men sneaking around on long journeys far away that are dangerous where they can't really talk because they're sneaking and they have weapons and they're literally going to kill something and then bring it back to camp like they're champions. Now all day what women are doing is spending time together and they are talking all day, yeah. talking <laughs> and singing about every possible thing. Women's sophisticated emotional intelligence comes from the fact that they were communicating for three and a half million years while guys were being quiet, right? And they were doing that filled with oxytocin because there was babies everywhere and they were breastfeeding and carrying and singing and lullabying them and doing process work. Men were doing dangerous work. So here, skip ahead to today. 
you have this idea of men who just want to go off by themselves together and go get into secret trouble together and not talk about how they feel and maybe even it be dangerous and violent even, right? That's like the desire of men as it should be. And women want to talk all the time and spend time together and communicate and hold babies and puppies and get all they're really good at that stuff. So you've got this classic thing of, oh, he just won't open up and talk about how he feels. He doesn't know how. And the guy, like, she just won't stop talking. It's like, we need to learn how to understand each other. We are this way for a reason, right? We are supposed to be this way. Um, and we need to be really clear about what we want. Because does the guy really want his wife to go on that hunting trip with him? Probably not. It's probably It might be fun for a minute. It's probably not ultimately going to turn him on. And she probably doesn't want him sitting there becoming her best friend either. You know, does he need to learn how to emotionally communicate? Yes. Does she need to learn how to take care of herself? For sure. But we don't need to take these roles to such extremes that we neutralize ourselves. And it's okay for there to be a whole realm of stuff that's secret to men and secret to women. So what goes on with men? We need male societies where we gather together and we share things that are for men. We need that. And women need that too. There's stuff going on with women that men just don't get, don't need to get, don't really need to understand that much. For instance, what you do when you're on your cycle together, what you do when you bring your babies forth, how you handle that. That is sort of, I don't want to say a secret society, but there is a men's society and a women's society within any natural community. And I feel like we, we could go back toward that in a really healthy way. Not in a way where we hide things or, or where people are kept from it, but in a way where we celebrate that there's differences in us. And this thing we're doing now is you're not almost, almost not allowed to talk about the differences. And they're so obvious to all of us that it's actually a little crazy. I also think it's a little insane that we expect two people, a man and a woman, to live 24 hours a day inside of a little house together when we come from a place where we spend our time separately and we come back together. So I love the idea of the indigenous lifestyle. You get up in the morning, there's a fire, you have breakfast, the men go off and hunt, the women go gather, they spend time singing, these guys spend quiet, they come back at the end of the day, they eat, they sit around the fire, tell stories and dance, everybody has a little bit of drug or drink, they go to bed, they make love, and they start over the next day. This sounds like what most of us wish we were doing all day, and instead we're chasing around this crazy artificial life that can never bring us the happiness that's biologically programmed into us. Mm, so many awesome nuggets in there, and just, yeah, so much to soak up. Um, I created a weekly gathering of women every Tuesday night called the Goddess Group. And the reason why I created that was not only was I so bored out of my brain sitting behind my computer by myself, that I was craving that feminine energy. I was craving that red tent feeling. So I created this beautiful sacred space of anywhere between 30 and 40 women where we gather every Tuesday night. Um, we do a, a guided meditation and then we, we talk about a different topic and it's sacred and beautiful and the women that just open up and share and lots of women come on their own for the first time and it's such a beautiful space and for me personally over the past like three years I've been really returning to my wild woman I've mm. been totally embracing my moon cycle I've been diving deep into that and fertility health and you know surrounding myself with those beautiful goddess feminine energies and embracing it you know there was a point where I was like no I should I should I should be okay on my own. And I was like, stuff that. I am a female. I crave that energy. I crave that connection with other women. And I was I would always look at my husband and, and he would definitely, and I'm not sure if you're the same, he would be content never seeing another human being in his life. You know, he's like, <laughs> He's like, as long as I've got our little boy and and you, he's like, if I never saw anyone again, he's like, I'm content. And I'm like, I would go insane if I just saw, I love him so much, but I, I need to, I feed off that energy. So um, I don't know if you're the same. How do you well, feel about that? Yeah, I think we're talking about something really biological here. Yeah, yeah women need this feedback. They need this communication. You know, something that I, I learned, 
learned, uh, and this is really valuable for, for women who are listening to this. I'm guessing we're mostly talking to women right now. So I'll say take this back to your man. Um, one thing that happens in nature, see, men are stupid when it comes to what's going on in the social dynamics around them. You guys see this all the time. You look at us and you're like, how does he not see those two are sleeping together, those two are having an affair, that guy just did whatever. How does he not feel that he's making her feel uncomfortable? Like, we're not so hip to what's going on because, again, shh, we're hunting. We're not, we're focused on one thing and we're trying to kill it. Women are aware of the whole network because they were talking in nature, communicating. When men would come home at the end of the day, they need an intelligence report about what's going on in the environment. They need to know who's done what, who's seeing who, who's sleeping with who, where's there a snake in the camp, where did you guys spot that jaguar, what's going on over at the ocean. All these stories need to emerge. So men, when you come home at the end of the day and the woman, it feels like, man, she just wants to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. It's helpful to think of it as an intelligence report. She's feeding you data about the whole, everything going on in your social network. All the stuff that she just needs to unload it, unload it, unload it. Now I look at that like, awesome. I just grabbed the nuggets out of that that I need. Yeah. Like, get it, get it, get it. She's telling me all the stuff that I'm not aware of that's happening because I could go my whole life and not see another person. She's feeding you the data. So think about the man comes back from the hunt and he, he finds out about all the stuff he's been missing throughout the day. And it's important information and they work together, right? So that's really crucial. And I think women are, have a better sense of what there it is that men provide that they really need. Now in nature, what men really provide that women need? A couple of things. Firm and meat. <laughs> and... I want to point out that in, <laughs> obviously there's more than that, safety, protection, someone they can release. And oh, you said the word open earlier. Women need that safety so that they can open. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that what's truly the feminine truly craves is the ability to open as completely as she can open in love, as far as she can go. And what's interesting when you said about you get 40 women together, they'll open and open and open. But if we brought one male in there, the entire dynamic will change. And conversely, if we get a bunch of guys together and we bring one woman and we're all like, <laughs> yeah. like that instantly changes. So we can't, we can't do that, right? But in one thing that I think is important to understand is that in, in where humans come from in nature, a woman and a man live within a community of about 50 people. And they're related to many of those people. And they've known them their entire lives. There's a complete trust and nobody gets left behind and nobody goes without. So we don't need, a woman doesn't need one man to provide for her and her family. That's so crucial to understand. A lot of the submissiveness that women have had to take on is because in this culture, she's got to find somebody to provide all those things she can't provide. Mm. She's got to raise children. She, how, you know what it's like for a woman to try to raise children effectively the way she wants to, to be present with them, to nurture them and nurse them, and at the same time hold a job down, and at the same time do the housework, and at the same time do the cooking. It's like, it's too much. She needs a helpmate. But she used to have a community of people who did this together. Women have been under the husbandry model. She's kind of left having to trade her sexuality and sensuality for someone who will take care of her. And this is an unfortunate outcome of the husbandry model that didn't used to exist. It just didn't. There has been throughout history, women have, we do know in hunter-gatherer societies, women who are single will trade sex for meat sometimes. Men go out and do that hard stuff. They go get the meat. They also go get the honey. It's another interesting thing. Stuff women don't want to do. Climb up on the, you know, the cliffside and get the... Men do the dangerous stuff, right? Most of the women listening prefer a guy to get under their engine than to do that themselves. Most women will. Those hard, difficult, complicated, mechanical tasks, women need men for that. Men need women to manage the social networks, to take care of the babies, to bring for all that stuff... We need each other. We need to balance each other, you know? It's so important that we... It's so important that the, that the real feminine archetype emerges. I think men are just... We're already a little afraid 
of the wildness in women. We have been for a long time. Our daddies were, their daddies were, and their daddies were. And now what we're seeing is women who seem to want to take over our role, and it's real threatening. And if we then try to step into our role, we sometimes get shamed and scolded for it. Um, I will say this to men. Hey, if you can um, be really masculine and also have your heart open, you can get away with it. Every time. Women love masculine men. They just do. They love it. What they don't love is douchey men who they... I don't think guys realize how much you guys are psychic. Yeah. How easily you see right through it. Oh, totally. It's like, I like, I'll, I'll watch it. Like when the guy's just being cool, masculine, yeah, baby, blah, 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 blah. It's like, dude, she sees through that. She can tell your heart's not there. She can feel that. We don't have that as well, right? So guys don't realize they can be as masculine as they want to be as long as they bring presence and authenticity. But, you know, I think what we need to understand is a woman wants to open, 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 open. And women understand that's not what men want in themselves. They want you to, for sure. They don't want to open. We want to feel free. We want freedom. We want to risk our lives sometimes. We want to go up to our edge. That's why we want to drive fast. That's why we want to jump off cliffs. That's why we want to shoot guns. That's why we want to do all these crazy things that you're like, why would you do that? Because when we're on the edge of life and death, like when we were in the big game hunts, hunts that we come from, when we're, when we're out risking it all for you, we feel so free. And freedom is the ultimate thing we're questing after. But for a woman, it's not. It's, it's love and it's opening in love and it's getting to her deepest core. And so if men could just sub create the space that supports that for women and women could give men that space they need to go experience that freedom, we would find a lot more rapport. But women often are trying to open men up like they're another woman and men are trying to toughen up the woman like she's another guy. And this is just taking us nowhere fast. Yeah. And then it just ends up like this, you know, that there's no unity. But when, you know, when they're truly in their truth and their elements, it's just like it aligns. It just flows and it works. Um, yeah. If, if, a, if a woman imagines, as a woman, if you imagine what it feels like when, let's say that you are a feminine woman and you're looking for a man. And you go out on a date with a guy and you start thinking, whoa, this guy's put more energy into his clothes than I did. This guy had his eyebrows waxed. I think that's a fake tan. He's got a manicure. His teeth are bleached. Those kind of things for a woman are usually a turn. A feminine woman is going to be turned off by a man who's more hung up on all of those things than she is. Women, that's what it feels like to us. When you're wearing shoulder pads and trying to become the CEO of everything, it's like, it's the same kind of turnoff. It's too masculine. We don't, our energy and the thing that we, pr we bring to the table can't be received by you in the same way that the guy who takes better care of his nails than you do feels like you can't trust him fully to be there for you if you need him. It's so, think about it. It's equal opposite. It's not that women are screwing this up and men are, or men are screwing it up and women aren't. We're all screwing it up. And I think if we just can come back to what's natural. So again, it's like back full circle, the rewild yourself idea. It's so simple. It's like, just let the expression of what's natural to you emerge. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff just dissolves away, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like over the past couple of years, the more I have embraced my feminine, it's been so much fun. Like it really <laughs> has been really fun getting back in touch with my femininity because before that it was like I've got to work hard and I've got to make a job and I've got to really earn money and I want to buy my own investment property so that I'm successful and I'm secure and all of this push, push, push. And then, you know, when I met my husband a few years ago, it was like I was a really, because he was so masculine, I was able to step into my feminine a lot more and really melt into it. And then that's when I fully embraced, you know, being a goddess, being a feminine and, and just, you know, my moon cycle and fertility and just those things that we often, when we're in our early 20s, suppress, you know, with the pill, we suppress that. And it's almost like, you know, skipping your period um, 
it's like, yes, I don't have it. When now, when I, when I get my, when I'm on my first day of my moon, I'm like, celebration, yes. Like it is a true celebration of being a woman and being feminine. And, you know, my husband's like, amazing, congratulations. This is, you know, he says things like that. You're so beautiful and wow, you look what your body can do. How amazing is it? And we celebrate it. Um, so it's really been beautiful and fun and exciting for me to step into my feminine over the past couple of years. And I would highly, you know, suggest everybody watching to, you know, return to that wild woman, return to that beautiful feminine energy that every woman has deep within them. Yeah. And you know, it's not, uh, it's not like, oh, you just sit around and be a glass doll, right? I mean, look at all the things you're doing. It's not, that's not what we mean, right? It's like, Women have been the keepers of the mysteries. Women were the herbalists, the healers. Women were the doulas and the midwives. Women brought more calories to the tribe than men did. Women were the consistent food providers. Women raised the children. Women educated the children. It's like, it's not like, oh, just a passive role. So when we say return to the feminine, obviously we're not saying like return to being the good housewife who just does the dishes and, you know, cleans the house. It's like, no, women are dynamic and powerful. It's just power that comes through receptivity versus through that push. Mm-hmm. And know that no, if you push hard, you are going to attract people who receive. Mm-hmm. So one thing that happens is the more masculine a woman gets, the more feminine the male she'll attract will be and vice versa. When men are very feminine, they attract really masculine males. And so again, like I said, I was just in LA where I think really, you know, because Los Angeles tends to lead things for the United States. What we see there right now is a lot of guys who are just, that are, are, are like, it's strange. They're so feminine that it's like, oh, they're, but they're heterosexual. Okay. So it's like, I try to understand like what I'm seeing. And it's like, oh, that man is with a woman. She's a really strong woman and he's a really feminine man. They, they find each other that way, but it's not necessarily what they want. So I think a woman can have a functioning business. She can have a really well cared for home. She can have all those things without having to, to trade her femininity away. Mm. She can do that and be receptive. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. That just perfectly summed it up because so many people like feel like they can't have it both, have, Mm. have everything. And you just totally clarified that, you know, and, and I'm a perfect example of that. And, and it's, you know, I'm still very driven and I love what I do, but you know, I'm very good at stepping into that feminine role as well. And it is a little bit of a dance. You know, there are times when, you know, I'm in the middle of a launch and and it does call for me to be a little bit more masculine. But then when I close my laptop and I walk into the kitchen, it's like, right, I'm feminine goddess Uh now. That, I think that what you just said is really important. I want to add a piece that I maybe haven't said explicitly, and that's that we all have a masculine and feminine piece. You know, many years ago, I kind of had a ceremony for myself. I was like, I'm going to marry myself. I'm going to marry the feminine part of myself to the masculine part of myself so that I don't run around as half a person always needing to be fulfilled by somebody else. That said, when I come together with a woman, I want to be the driver. Mm. I and want we to be. Want that. We, the yeah. feminine, want that. I want to show you that I can hold a space where you can completely trust that you can open as fully as you can open. I want to be blown away with layers of openness that I didn't know existed. And I want you to be blown away with layers of openness that you didn't know existed. That said, when we're not together, sometimes you've got to be in your masculine. You've got to make things happen, mm-hmm. right? It's, that, it's what you just said. When you come back together, it's that ability to bring your femininity to the connection and for the man to bring his masculinity. I know in my field, I constantly need to go into my feminine in order to hear another person, in order to connect, in order to access my emotional intelligence, things that don't necessarily come out of my more masculine parts. Um, But it's that when I come together with a woman, she can be a woman and I can be a man and we can celebrate that for each other. Um, but yeah, we all have to be able to flow back and forth. And if you're single more, probably more than ever, you're going to have to bring that masculine peace until you find that balancer for you. But, um, but don't be afraid to set that aside when it comes to your actual connection so that you get to really step into it's, it's the, it's the, a strong masculine presence will allow you to go into that feminine presence. And so make sure also that when you're choosing a partner, 
and you choose a partner that can support you the way you really want to be supported. This is just amazing and I'm so grateful for all of your insights. Um, it's just been perfect and a topic that I absolutely love talking about so, so yeah. much and I'm beyond grateful to have you share your knowledge and your wisdom with uh, my beautiful tribe today. And before we kind of wrap up, um, I wanted to share with the tribe, um, like I mentioned in Daniel's bio, he has an amazing online health supplement store called Surf Rival um, and they're giving us 10% off all of their products, um, which I'll put all the information below this video. But is there any products in particular that you would recommend for for women? <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's a dynamic product line I've built over the last seven, eight years now. Um, the, we carry an elk antler product, which I love giving to both men and women because it cranks up libido and sex drive and it really gets hormone production up. In women, we often have really great results with that. So we've seen a lot of really interesting things. We've seen women who have been struggling to remain pregnant, who keep miscarrying, been able to bring babies full term. That's how I got my godson, actually. Um, seen uh, it help to regulate menstrual cycles, you know, because obviously right now we're in, a, in an era where menstrual cycles are tend to be really out of balance. Uh, we've seen it help to bring um, progesterone levels, all kinds of wonderful things. So that's a product I love telling people about. That said, and you know my work most, I don't love doing product sales, you know, it's like not my, my thing, but I do, you know, appreciate anybody who wants to go check that company out or any of the other things we're doing online. Yeah, well, Daniel is doing so many amazing things um, online and his podcast is more Honestly, and I'm not just saying this because I'm talking to you, it's my one of my favorite podcasts. And I my husband loves it too, and I listen every week and some of the stuff you do with Kim and Ami, holy moly, like blows <laughs> my mind. Um, I'm absolutely devastated that her Mexico retreat next year is sold out, like devastated. Um, um, so I'm on the wait list to go to that. Uh, but yeah, your podcasts uh, are just amazing and everything that you put out into the world is, is awesome. So please jump on board, follow, subscribe, do everything. Just get Daniel in your life because it will change your life. And also get him in your partner's life, you know? Trust me, it is going to be severely beneficial for you, your sex life, everything, your happiness, health, and... My last podcast with Kim and Ami is specifically really geared towards men be, being men again. So if you've got a guy at home, you might want to point him towards that recent episode called Consent is Implied. Because uh, I think it's a real... Uh, it's calling guys out to step up and really be what women want them to be. Ugh. Seriously, amen. I've just, I've had goosebumps this whole talk because I'm just so passionate about what you do. I'm totally honored to be able to interview you today and I'm just so grateful for the work you're doing for your authenticity, for your masculinity, for your openness, like just everything that you radiate. I'm just so grateful and all of the wisdom that you've shared with my tribe. I hope they got a lot out of it. Um, I hope their partners get a lot out of it. But thank you so much for being here. I'm just beyond grateful. Uh, thank you for having me, Melissa.